Welcome to another Os Hablo Academy webinar. Today's webinar is Sargent Hardware Adjustments and Features. My name is Russell Corvo, and I will be your lead instructor today. This ses session should take about 50 minutes. During this session, your lines will be muted. However, you can post questions using the question and answer icon at the bottom of the page, and we will save time at the end for your questions. This session is being recorded and will be available for review within 24 hours at Os Oblo Academy's website. Also, uh, in lieu of a certificate of completion for these shorter trainings, you will receive an email as your proof of attendance that can be submitted to industry association partners such as DHI and ALOA for industry CEUs in lieu of the certificate of completions. Keep in mind that Os Oblo Academy has over 50 online classes available at no cost. So let's get started. So I just wanted to mention, we do have a couple other great webinars coming up this week. Tomorrow at two o'clock, we have Kate Flowers and upgrading your K through 12 hands-free and touchless solutions. And on Friday, July 9th at two o'clock, we have Chad uh, presenting the correct tools and methods for installing for installing commercial hardware. And that's critical. You, it's important that you have the correct tools for installing the hardware that you're gonna install. It's always not as easy as you may think. So for today's class, we're gonna go over some of the adjustments and features for various Sargent products. Here's a quick look at the products that we'll be looking at today. First, proper adjustment of door closers and identifying installation errors. Sargent 700 series electromechanical exit device trim motorized electric latch traction, power mode versus timer mode, adjusting conceal of vertical rods and items to be aware of. Also how to check and adjust for surface vertical rod exit devices because they are very different and they're not done in the same manner at all for Sargent products. Next we have Sargent EcoFlex mortise lock, fail safe or fail secure. How to configure Sargent's multi-function mortise lock, which we do have one if you're not aware of it. And lastly, delayed egress devices, how it works and how to figure and how to configure the operate options, excuse me. So let's get going. So first we're going to look at door closures. Okay. When it comes to door closures, there's basically four, five adjustments or five adjustments with one of the adjustments being an option. The first adjustment on the door closer we're looking at is the closer spring adjustment. This affects the entire uh, cycle of the door closer. It's actually what you use to size the door closer. When you receive a, a door closer from Sargent and you don't ask for it sized, you can resize it from one through six by adjusting this uh, socket head screw at the end of the door closer and that will adjust the spring. So you, these door closers are fully adjustable one through six and it also determines the amount of force required to open the door and the amount of force available to close the door. And don't forget with this valve or with this adjustment you can also compensate for different door conditions. Next we have the back check valve. <clears throat> Approximately at 70 degrees of the opening cycle, the back check valve begins to slow the door's motion. This prevents the door from slamming into the door's backstop. This valve is used to control the, the intensity of the backstop. By closing this down completely, the, literally the door will come to about 70 degrees and stop dead almost. So you can adjust it how quickly you want it to slow down. And it should be a very nice transition. So when the door is swung open, it should slowly slow down and reverse back in the other direction. This should be a very smooth transition. Okay, we always recommend that you use door stops with doors though. Next, we have the delayed action, and this is an option on more, most door closers. This will hold the door open for up to 20 seconds, and it, can't, and it can be adjusted for the amount of time that it will hold the door open for. This feature is great for applications where you're bringing carts and gurneys through doors frequently because it will literally hold the door open. And this is available for all door closer, op, or all door closer applications and arms available. Let's, are the slides being presented? You're not seeing anything. Okay, that's not good. Tom, are you seeing anything, my presentation? Yes, I'm seeing everything you're putting up. Okay. 
Um, one person is saying that they're not able to see the screen. Um, can you tell me if you still can't see the screen? Because if you're not seeing my screen, you're missing a lot of this presentation. You still can't see my screen. Um, unfortunately, I think it's a problem at your end because uh, I'm broadcasting the screen. One of the other students is seeing the screen. Is anyone else having problems seeing the screen other than this one person? And your best bet may be to log off and log back on. You may Something may reconfigure differently so you can get back on. If no one else is having difficult seeing the screen, I'm going to continue. Okay, so we were talking about door closes and we were talking about the different valves. Right now we're up to the delayed action valve. And this valve is usually an option when it comes to door closers. And this will hold the door open for up to 20 seconds and it can be adjusted. This is great for interior doors where you're bringing carts and gurneys through. Our next option is the, the closing speed valve. The closing speed valve takes effect from the 90 degree position all the way down to the 12 degree position. And I see you've joined us again. Are you able to see the screen this time? I hope you are. One of, okay, continuing on. So the closing speed valve. This controls the door opening from the 90 degrees all the way down to the 12 degree position. Okay. This should take more. This is usually set to take about seven seconds for this time period for the door to close from 90 degrees all the way down to 12 degrees. And lastly, we have the latching speed. And this controls the door during the final 12 degrees of the door swing. This is probably the most critical because this is make sure that the door is going to close and latch every single time. So if the door doesn't close and latch every single time, there's no reason to have the door closer on there. So you have to make sure that it closes and latches. And oftentimes you'll see a door closer closing very slowly. And at the very end, you'll see it speed up a little bit to make sure that it has enough oomph to make sure the latch bolt um, enters the strike and the door closes completely. Okay. Anti-A117.1, that's basically the standard for ADA. And one of their standards is from the 90 degree position all the way down to the 12 degree position, it must take more than five seconds. And that's why most installers usually set this to about seven seconds. But the only requirement is that it takes more than five seconds. The other requirement is that the maximum force to pull open or to push open doors other than fire rated doors for interior hinged doors should be five pounds. Okay, interior hinge doors. Fire rated doors um, are more critical that the doors close and latch, so they take precedence over ADA. So fire rated doors have to close and latch, but interior doors should take less than five pounds to open or to push or to push or pull open. So next we're going to take a look at a couple applications where people have problems and Knowing how the application should look can help you determine if you have an issue. So here we're going to look at a standard or a regular application to start with. Okay, this is what you see here. So when you're installing this application here, it's very important that you know how far the door is going to be allowed to swing open. Okay, because we have different ways. In the standard mounting, the door of maximum opening for the door is about 120 degrees, while you have an alternative where it will swing up to 160 degrees. And it will change where you're mounting the door closer on the door and where the arm is being attached to the frame. And that's what dimension A is and dimension B. So it's very important that you have a good idea of how you want, how far you want the door to swing so you know where you're mounting the door closer correctly. Is there a wall directly behind the door or can it swing 180 degrees? Okay, so that's what dimension A and dimension B. With Sargent products, the spring adjustment is going to be away from the hinge in this application. So it's very important that the spring adjustment screw 
is away from the hinge and it can go in either way. So you can take this door closer and actually mount it 180 degrees, but it won't operate properly. So it's, this is one area you need to look at the instruction sheets. Next, when you install the arm onto the frame, the first location it should be in the pivot point should be away from the hinge, not towards the hinge. The reason they do that is because if you actually need more closing power afterwards, they recommend then you bring it closer to the hinge to, to obtain an additional five to 10% 10, 10 more closing power. But they want you to start on the lower one to start with. Also with Sargent door closes, which is very unique to Sargent, is that Sargent always tells you has an index number has an index mark on the spindle and numbers on the arms all the ways around. And the instruction sheets will tell you what in the index mark and what number it has to line up with for the application and for the hand of the door. So in this application, the index mark is lining up for a number two, okay? So for standard or regular application, because this is what this is called, the arm that's in yellow here is always at 90 degrees to the door. So if it's not at 90 degrees to the door, it has not been adjusted correctly. Because when you first put the arm on the door closer, it comes off at 90 degrees to the arm. But we want the arm coming off the frame to be 90 degrees. So this is called the preload. And this is how much force it's gonna hold it against the door stops with. And this is critical. So make sure that the arm coming off the frame is at 90 degrees and not the arm coming off the door closer. Here's a quick look at a regular or standard application. Next, a quick look at the top jam application. For top jam ap applications, some of the advantages is that it's completely indoors, so it's great for exterior applications because the door closer never gets rained on. It's, you do lose a little power over a standard or a regular application. It only retains about 80% of the power. And we do have different arms for the reveal. The reveal is gonna be from the surface of the frame where the door closer is mounted to the door itself. And this reveal will change considering that the door is mounted on the other side of the frame. So we do have arms that can handle up to reveals up to eight inches, okay? This will allow the door to swing 180 degrees and the door closer is always on the push side of the door. With this installation method, once again, the spring adjustment is away from the hinge when you're mounting it into the bracket. And once again, we have the index number. So for a left-hand door, you're gonna have the index mark on a number three and for a right-hand door, it will be on a number one, okay? And then when you make your final adjustments, when you first put the arm on the door closer, it's gonna be off at this angle here. It's very important that for top jam applications, the arm coming off the door closer must be at 90 degrees to the door, which is right here. Okay, so the arm coming off the door closer at 90 degrees to the door. Next is a parallel application. And this is part of the reason why I was pointing out this spring adjustment, because in this case here, the spring adjustment is towards the hinge, while the other two applications, it was away from the hinge. So it makes a difference. So it's very important that you realize that. Once again, you do have index marks. So depending on the hand, you have an index mark for a left-hand door, which is number four, and for a right-hand door, it would be a number five. And when you finally adjust this, the pivot point should never be resting on the door itself. The pivot point should always be about an inch to an inch and a half off the face of the door. Okay, and that's how you can tell if it's adjusted correctly. But if it's resting against the face of the door, it is not adjusted correctly. Next, I'm going to show you the, one of the best videos I've, I've ever seen showing what each of the valves does. When this video starts up, the door closer valves, all the valves are wide open, so there's nothing controlling the door's motion. So it slams into the wall in the back. The first valve they're going to adjust is the back check valve. This is going to slow the door down so it doesn't smash against the back wall. Next is latch speed. This is gonna be that last 12 degrees. You'll notice the door slows down right about the last 12 degrees. That's when the latching valve is taking effect, right there. Next, we're gonna look at the closing speed. That's from the 90 degrees all the way down to the 12 degree position. And 
and that controls, you know, this should take more than five seconds minimum, normally set around seven seconds. And lastly, we have the delayed action. And this is great for interior doors, really not recommend for exterior doors because it does hold the door open for up to 20 seconds. And that's a long time when you're sitting here watching it. So a lot of heat or a lot of cold air can come in and out. And that's why we recommend them interior doors opposed to exterior doors. As you can see, 20 seconds is a long time when you're just sitting here watching the door close. Okay, next, we're going to take a look at Sergeant Exit Device Trim. In case you weren't aware of it, the Sergeant Exit Device Trim, the 700 Series ET Trim, is now feel-selectable between fail-safe and fail-secure. We've actually incorporated EcoFlex technology into the trim. It's fully backwards compatible with existing trim, but now it's feel selectable. Right in this area here, you can select it from fail safe to fail secure by just moving this little switch here. Keep in mind, we'll always supply exactly what you order, but if you happen to order the wrong thing, it can easily be switched in the field. Secondly, the EcoFlex ET trim can operate on 12 or 24 volts right out of the box, so it doesn't even need to be specified at all. And keep in mind that EcoFlex technology reduces energy consumption by up to 95%. And this has been certified by Green Circle. Next, we're going to take a look at the 56 dash and motorized electric latch retraction of versus solenoid. So basically, there's been two ways of retracting latch bolts on exit devices. It's either been a solenoid or a motor. And some of the basic differences are, is that a solenoid required a controller while a motor could use a standard power supply. And a controller is basically a special power supply that has a capacitor in it. While a motor design doesn't require a capacitor in it, so it can use a standard power supply. With a solenoid, you have a large inrush. So normally you need to use an EPT opposed to a standard electric hinge, because oftentimes you can have quite a large inrush, up to 16 amp inrush rushing into the product. And if the wires are too small, then it can burn out the wires. With motorized devices, there is no inrush like that. It has a very constant draw. Solenoids can be very loud while motors are very quiet. The only advantage really with solenoids is that they're slightly faster than motors and motors are slightly slower. Here's a sound comparison between a solenoid and a motorized design. One second, try that one more time. So that's a motorized design, 55 of dB. All the solenoids at a 67 high dB. So it is quite a bit quieter. With Sargent's electric latch retraction, the 56S, you have two different modes. You have a power mode and a timer mode. So in the power mode, this third toggle from the end has to be in the down position. Okay, so in the power mode, when electricity is applied to the exit device, the exit device will retract and remain retract as long as you have power applied. As soon as the power is removed, the exit device will no longer be retracted. So it can be used with a momentary switch. So it will just stay down as long as you're holding the button in. But once you release the button, the exit device will become undogged. You can also use the power mode with a maintain switch. So if you wanted the exit device to be dogged from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night, you can easily do it with a maintain switch by turning it on, energizing it during the day. And at the end of the day, you'll de-energize it to cut the power, okay? The other mode is a timer mode. So with the timer mode, the third toggle from the end has to be in the up position as we're showing you right here. And this is gonna put it into the timer mode. So because it has a built-in timer, you can adjust how long it will stay retracted for. So you only have to create an initial contact and it will stay retracted for a set period of time. So with a momentary switch, you would, or excuse me, with a momentary switch, you would hit the timer or hit the button and the rail would retract for a set period of time ranging from zero to 20 seconds and that's fully adjustable. And then after the 20 seconds, it will become automatically undogged, okay? 
Um, this is going to be adjusted with the three toggles at the very end of the controller. And this is visible when you remove the end cap from the end of the exit vise. So right here, the way it's set up right here with these toggles, so with four in the off position and five and six in the on position, that is for four seconds. So the rail will stay dog for four seconds. When you're using motorized electric latch retraction exit devices with a low energy operator, as I mentioned, they're a little bit slower than a solenoid. So you need to have allow enough time for the exit device to retract the latch bolt completely before the low energy operator opens the door. Keep in mind, if the low energy operator opens, starts to open up the door before the exit device retracts the latch bolt. It's going to cause a bind position and the exit device is going to win. The exit device is much stronger. So you will cause a problem. So it's very important that you make sure that the latch bolt retracts completely, then the door opens. And this is usually an adjustment in the low energy operator. And we usually recommend about 750 milliseconds. Next, we're going to talk about concealed vertical rod and adjusting concealed vertical rods, okay? <clears throat> if vertical rods need to be adjusted, one thing you should always do before taking down the doors is it's very critical that you measure the gap at the very top of the door, okay? This is critical. This should be an eighth of an inch, but it's very important that you measure this distance. Also, it's very important Important that you measure the distance on the floor from the bottom of the door to the floor, but you have to consider the entire sweep of the door. Okay, so it's very critical that you measure both. So what happens if the floor is uneven? So say if the door is closed and you have an eighth of an inch gap when the door is in the closed position, but when you open it up completely, there's five eighths of an inch gap. This is a perfect situation. This, the exit device will work perfectly fine without any issues. Okay and you'll have full bolt engagement. So the problem is, is if you have a situation like this, in example two, where when the door is closed, you have five eighths of an inch gap underneath the door, but when the door is open, you only have an eighth of an inch gap underneath the door. This is gonna be a problem because the bolt cannot be pulled up that much and it's gonna create a line on the floor. So you, you can't, so it's very important that you notify that the floor has to either be leveled to have two point engagement or a threshold has to be put in, okay? Because the exit device cannot compensate for that half inch distance between the open position and the closed position. And if you adjust it while it's in the closed position, you will get a line here on the floor and that's gonna be an issue, okay? So that's very important. And you will lose that security because you won't have it. And this would be the line that I was referring to that the bottom bolt scraping on the floor will create a line. So if you're in a situation like this, it has to be made known that the floor is not level and the floor either has to be leveled or you're not gonna have any bottom bolt engagement or you can use a threshold. So if you're not aware of this, this is always at the top of the door. This actually comes in contact with the frame when the door closes. So when you push on a concealed vertical rod exit devices, the bolts are held in the retracted position as the door swings. When the door closes and this little button hits the frame, the bolts are released and allowed to, in, and allowed to shoot into the strike to keep the door closed, okay? When you're adjusting concealed vertical rods, the best way to do it is with the rail in the dogged position. So you always want to dog it completely. If you have hex key dogging, use the hex key to dog it down. If you have cylinder dogging, make sure it's dogged down. Okay. And now we're going to go over how do you adjust the rods for this situation. So say if we have an exaggerated, so say if we have an eighth of an inch gap at the top of the door or less, what you're going to do is you're going to have the top bolt flush with the top of the door and everything will work perfectly fine and you'll have maximum engagement. But say if you have a gap of 3 16 of an inch at the top of the door, which is a very big gap. The way you have to calculate this out is you, we always want an eighth of an inch clearance. So you go 3 16 of an inch minus an eighth of an inch clearance. Okay, so now you want the top bolt to extend out of the top of the door by a 16th of an inch. Okay. And that way you'll get the maximum engagement allowing, allowing for an eighth of an inch clearance. One thing you always want to keep an eye out for is if you ever see a mark like this on the frame, that means the bolt's not being retracted enough to allow the door to close without the bolt hitting the frame. So this is a bad sign. This is telling you that the top bolt is not adjusted correctly. 
and you always adjust the top bolt before you adjust the bottom bolt. So taking a look at the bottom bolt situation, so say if we have 5 eighths of an inch gap underneath the door, okay, and we want an eighth of an inch clearance, so it's going to be 5 eighths of an inch minus an eighth of an inch. So we're going to allow the bottom bolt to extend out of the bottom of the door a half of an inch. This will ensure maximum bolt engagement and the bolt will never hit the strike or the floor since we have an eighth of an inch clearance, okay? So you always take the distance that you measured, subtract an eighth of an inch, and that's how far the bolt should extend beyond the bottom of the door. When it comes to surface vertical rods, those are adjusted very differently. So with surface vertical rods, this may sound odd, but the best way to test this for sergeant uh, surface vertical rod exit devices is to put one hand on the door here and to push on the bar very, very slowly. And as soon as the door starts to open, let the rail go and verify that it's gone back into hold back position. And when I'm talking about the hold back position, you see this is the top latch here and it must go into hold back position. See, this is the hold back position. So when you push in on the bar, it has to retract the bolt far enough. So this pin get, engages this lever arm here, okay? and that will hold the latch bolt in the retracted position, okay? This is very critical. So if it doesn't go into hold back and you have a fire rated exit device, the door will not close and latch. So it's critical that it always goes into hold back. So next we're gonna take a look at how do you adjust surface vertical rods, top and bottom latching. And one nice thing with Sargent, all you need to do is remove the center case cover. You no longer need to remove the top and bottom covers as you had at one point. So what you do is remove the center case cover. This one pin here just will slide right out. And then by rotating the rod here with your fingers, you can extend it or shorten the length of the stroke of the rod. So rotating it with your fingers, looking up at the top case, so looking up at the top case, rotating clockwise will shorten the rod. So if it's extended out and it's hitting the frame, you wanna shorten it. And if you rotate it counterclockwise, it's going to lengthen it, which will give you more engagement. So the situation is you want to have the maximum engagement, but always make sure that it goes into hold back. Okay. And once you have it adjusted correctly, you want to slide the pin back in there and you want to test the exit device again. Unlike concealed vertical rods where you make the adjustments and because you're making the adjustments laying down, the adjustments are final with concealed vertical rods. So when you install it back into the frame, it's set the way it is. With surface vertical rods, you're basically adjusting the vertical rods and then you're testing the exit device to make sure you have it right. It always has to go in a hold back. With Sargent's surface vertical rod exit devices, we do have multiple holes in the top rod and a single hole in the adjustment tube. So you do have quite a bit of adjustment in there. And keep in mind, put your hand on the door and push on the door and push on the bar very slowly. As Soon as the door starts to open, remove the top hand and verify that it went into hold back position. If it didn't go into hold back position, the latch bolt is extended up too high and it needs to be shortened. Next, we're gonna take a look at Sargent's EcoFlex mortise lock, okay? Once again, just like the exit device, the EcoFlex mortise lock is fail selectable, fail safe, or fail secure. You will always be buying this as a fail safe or a fail secure product as an 8270 or an 8271. But if you happen to buy the wrong product, it can always be changed in the field. And this is how it's done. So right now, this is in the fail secure position. And notice the position of this toggle clip here. So this is the fail secure position. And when I want it in the fail safe position, all I'm going to do is move this little toggle and it will go into the fail safe position once you've cycled it once with electricity. And that's all it takes to switch it. And these locks will work on 12 or 24 volts right out of the box. Next, we're going to take a quick look at Sargent's multifunction lock body. Hopefully, you know it's a multifunction lock body. So we have this green screw in this location here. So we have three different locations for this screw location and we can make eight different functions by moving the screw between these three locations. And one of the best things is, is that all of these functions require the same offset cam that the Sargent Mortis offset cam, which used on all of our products except for very few functions. So what functions can you make out of the multi-function lock body? You can make an office function out of it. So in this first location here, it's an office function. It will have a thumb piece on the inside that locks and unlocks the outside lever. 
By getting rid of the thumb piece, it's technically a classroom function. That green screw remains in the low, same location, but there's no thumb turn. So the only way you can lock and unlock the story is from the cylinder on the outside. By adding a second cylinder to it, it now becomes a classroom security function or classroom security intruder function, where both cylinders on the inside and outside will lock the outside lever. The inside lever will always allow free egress. And this is where that green screw is located in that same location. When the green screw is moved to the next location, it's used to make a storeroom function. Keep in mind a storeroom function, the outside lever is rigid all the, all the time. The only way you can enter this room is with the key to retract the latch bolt. And that would be an 04 function. We also have a storeroom or a service function that has no lever on the outside of the door with just a cylinder. There is still a lever on the inside of the door that will allow you to evacuate the room, but there's no, but there's no lever on the outside of the door. This is great for in applications where you have a lot of vandalism, where people are standing on the levers or trying to rip the lever off the door. This eliminates the lever from being ripped off. And this is an 8206. Our next is a mortise lock with an exit only, so there's nothing on the outside of the door. We have a lever on the inside that will allow you to evacuate, but there is no means of entering the building from the outside of the door. And the last one is an 8231, and that's a utility function. And this is an unusual function because there is no lever on the inside of the door. It only has a lever on the outside of the door. Once again, that is rigid all the time. The key retracts the latch bolt. Keep in mind, this would only be used on very shallow rooms or rooms with multiple exits because there is no way of getting out if this door closes behind you. Okay. And then when you move the screw to the very last position, which is over here, it's for a 36 function. And this is also for a closet function, and this has no lever on the inside either. So it has to be used on a room with multiple exits, okay? The key on the outside will lock and unlock the outside lever. And these are the, these are the eight different functions that you can make from this one lock body. So next, we're gonna take a quick look at how it works. So here's a closer look at the lock body. As you can see here, right on the lock body identifies the function number and where the screw is going to be located for that function number. Okay, so in this first location here, as you can see here, the green screw looking at the opposite side of the body, there's nothing around the screw. In this location here, the screw does absolutely nothing. It's basically a storage location. We didn't want to put the screw in a plastic bag in the box, so we figured if we located it on the lock body, people would have it in the future. Okay. So let's just go over basically how the lock works. So this is what the thumb turn or an emergency release would engage into. And when this is straight up and down, as you can see here, the locking slide is not engaged into the hub. So it's unlocked at this point right now. When you rotate the locking, the hub to 45 degrees as shown here, like when you turn on, rotate the thumb piece, now it's gonna lock the outside lever. As you can see here, the locking slide is now engaged into the hub, so the outside lever is now locked. When you rotate it to the 90 degree position, as you see here, once again, the outside lever is locked, but now the cylinder is actually retracting the latch bolt because the latch bolt is retracted here. And those are the three different stages of the mortise lock. Okay, so the cylinder retracts the latch bolt. So in this first location for an O5 function, we just went over this. It's a cylinder and a thumb piece. Let me just, we just went over this. One thing I do want to point out here is when you put the screw in for one of these functions, 04, 06, 13, or 31, it's very important that this hub here is rotated at 45 degrees like it's stamped into here. We stamped it right into the lock body to remind people before you put the green screw into this location, make sure that this looks like that. And that's why we have that there. So in this location here, what this screw is doing, it's actually right here and it's actually locking the hub so it's in the locked position. So the only thing the cylinder can do is rotate to retract the latch bolt, but the outside lever is always locked. The inside will always allow free egress, but the outside lever is always locked. Okay, so that's for these functions Bolt. here. Insert the screwdriver. And, and if you're not familiar with how to change the hand of a sergeant mortise lock, here's a quick look at how to change the hand of a sergeant mortise lock. Bolt. Insert the screwdriver blade into the triangular slot. Rotate the screwdriver to push the latch bolt out until the back of the bolt clears the lock body. 
and rotate 180 degrees until it drops back into the lock body. The dead latch is self-adjusting. So we have a triangular shaped slot. Make sure you rotate the screwdriver. Don't pry it out. That doesn't work very well. Rotate the screwdriver and it will extend the latch bolt past the front, which will allow you to rotate it around by hand. Next, verify the hand of the lock body. Red indicates the outside or locked side. If it is necessary to change the hand of the locking piece, turn the lock body so that the red mark on the locking piece is visible. Use a flathead screwdriver to push the locking piece toward the back of the lock body and rotate it 180 degrees until the red shows on the other side. To change the hand of One thing I do want to point out here, and this is critical, is when this hub is in the locked position where we have it for an 04 and 06 function or 31 function, this is in the locked position. You cannot rotate this red locking slide when it's in the locked position. The only way that can be done is when it's in the unlocked position. So if you ever buy an 04 function and a customer is having an issue with it saying they can't change the hand, what they'll need to do is remove the green screw, bring it into the unlocked position, rotate the locking slide around so it faces the other side. Then they need to put the green screw back in. Okay, because it can only be done when it's in the unlocked position. So when it's, the screw is in this position here, you cannot rotate the red locking slide. Next is a short little video if you've ever had a loose lever on a sergeant mortise lock. How to properly adjust a mortise lever. If the lever sticks or is too loose, the spindle on the outside lever needs to be adjusted to correct. Remove the outside lever and spindle. Tighten the nut with your fingers. Once tight, slightly loosen the nut so the closest outer star point aligns with the inner square. Reinsert the spindle and install on mortise lock body. When installed correctly, there will be minimal wiggle and the lever will operate smoothly. Okay, and now for our last subject, we're going to take a look at Sargent's Delayed Egress Device, which is the 59- option. If you're not familiar with Delayed Egress Devices, <clears throat> Delayed Egress Devices prevent someone from exiting from normally for 15 seconds. On certain doors, this is allowed. Okay, after the 15 seconds, the person's allowed to evacuate. So with the Sargent 59- we do have a couple different modes, okay? <clears throat> So when you first power this thing up, both, both LEDs will illuminate red for two seconds while concurrently hearing a buzzer sound for about a half a second. Both LEDs will illuminate green for two seconds with no buzzer, okay? The, uh, the illuminated red LEDs, that means it's in the maintain egress mode allowing free egress. When the LEDs are green, it designates that it is in the armed position, okay? And it does not allow egress, okay? So the three different modes are right here. You either have armed, and when it's in the armed position, nobody can exit for up to 15 seconds. And the two lights on it are gonna be in the green color. In the momentary egress, you're gonna have a flashing light that's gonna allow momentary egress. And in the maintain, and maintain egress, the lights are gonna be red which allows free egress. So really quick. So in the different modes, in the armed mode, the rail is armed. The latch bolt cannot be retracted by pushing in on the push rail for immediate egress. If the rail is depressed for one second, it will go into an alarm condition, okay? Modes of operation, momentary egress. So if you wanna let someone out for a moment, what you wanna do is you wanna rotate the key counterclockwise to the second click and remove the key. The red LED flashes for five seconds and the rail will disarm, allowing for momentary egress. After the five seconds, the delay expires and the rail will rearm itself. The unit is now in the armed position, the arm delayed egress position, okay? So that's how you, so if it's in the armed position and you wanna allow momentary egress, you stick the key and rotate it counterclockwise to the second click and it'll give you five seconds to, ex to exit. So if you wanna put it in the maintain egress, which allows full egress, 
you can stick the key in the cylinder and rotate clockwise to one click and then remove the key. The red LEDs will illuminate. The rail is disarmed and will allow the device to operate as a standard exit device and will permit free egress. Okay, so you rotate it clockwise till you hear the first click and that's gonna leave it in the maintain egress mode. To rearm the exit device, the way you're gonna rearm the exit device is you're gonna rotate the key counterclockwise to one click and then remove the key. Maintain the red LED de-energized and the green LED will illuminate. The rail is now armed and it is in the delayed egress mode. Okay, and the lights will be green. So the visible lights here. So if you see visible lights, if the lights are green, that means the rail is armed, the armed, and it's in the delayed egress mode. Okay, so it's not going to allow egress. If the color is red, that means you can go through the door without any problem. It works as a normal exit device. If the red is flashing red, then it's momentary egress and it's gonna allow you to egress for five seconds. And then if it's flashing red and green, that means it's been violated and someone has exited through the door. This exit device does have certain diagnostic features and we're going to touch on them here. When you take off, when you take off the end cap and you look in at the insert, on the far side over here, there's gonna be LEDs that are gonna light, okay? So over here, when you see the yellow LED, if the light is on, that means the latch bolt or the vertical rods are retracted. If the latch bolt, and if the light is off, that means the latch bolt or the vertical rods are extended, okay? So you want that light off when it's in the armed mode because you want them extended. The red LED, is going to tell you if the red light is on, that means the push rail is depressed. And if it's off, that means the push rail is released. Okay, and this is how you can tell if these different features are working. If the, or if the orange light is on, that means the door position switch is open and the door is open, which is a violation. And if it's off, that means the door position switch is gonna be closed. And that means the door is closed and secure. So we want it off. And lastly, the green stands for the magnet. So energize on, if the green light is on, the energize is magnetized and the door is preventing egress. When it's off, then it's de-energized. Okay, so keep this in mind. You want the latch bolts extended. So you want the yellow light should be off in standard operation. The red light should be off in standard operation and the orange light should be off. The only light that should be on is the green light saying that the battery is charged. You do have a few selectable options in here. And this is what we're gonna take a look at next is we're looking at these switches right in here. So when you slide the insert out, you have these switches right here. So this does come with a nuisance delay. So a nuisance delay will give you a short little buzz sound before it goes into a permanent alarm cycle. This will prevent people. So if they bump into the door by mistake, it won't go into a permanent cycle. So if you want S2, S21, on for a one second nuisance delay and it's off for no nuisance delay, okay? When you look at the next S2-2, now you have a nuisance audible. So do you want a sound or not? You can either turn the sound off or turn it on with toggle switch number two. With uh, toggle switches uh, three and four, these are set up how you set up your momentary delay egress. It's normally both of them are gonna be off for a five second delay, but you can extend this delay up to 40 seconds. So if you wanna allow a momentary delay of up to 30, you know, 40 seconds or 20 seconds, this is how you would adjust it. With toggle switches three and four allows you to, to set the momentary delay. And lastly, and this is one thing that a lot of people change because most people think green means go, and red means stop. The way the exit device is normally set up, red means that it is, it's free to allow egress and the green means that it's locked. And if you wanna change that, you can do that. With S, um, S2-5, on means red is armed, green means maintain momentary egress. While S5 off, the green would mean armed, okay? And the red would maintain a momentary egress. Okay. And lastly, you can change which LED is on the top or the bottom on whether you want it to be armed or not. 
And believe it or not, that brings us to the end of our presentation. We covered a lot of information here today. I'm gonna to open this up to see if we have any questions. And I apologize for the problem you had in the beginning of the presentation. Hopefully you were able to see the presentation from there on out. So if we have any questions, please bring up the questions. I do wanna thank you for your time and consideration today. And I do know it was a lot of information. I want to give you an idea of all the different options available for it. Not that you're gonna remember them here, but you're gonna go, hey, I can change that. That's part of the point of this. It doesn't seem like we have any more questions, so we're gonna call it a day. I would like to thank you very much for your time and consideration and enjoy the rest of your day and stay healthy. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye.